Hello, everybody. How's it going? So this is the episode three of me interviewing my friends, hoping that they share some valuable information that you can then use for your processing or you know your application um, or even during your job search here in America. Now, the previous two videos was more focused uh, after, uh, regarding the path after graduation, but today I have a very special uh, person with me um and this is going to be more geared towards academics uh, but i'll first let him introduce uh to you guys and then we can discuss further so hi ronish welcome to my channel please give us an introduction so that we can kick this off hi sans thanks for having me uh my name is ronish um from nepal uh from Kathmandu itself i'm doing my phd currently at wpi which is in Massachusetts at Worcester Polytechnic Institute. And yeah, let's go ahead. So thank you, Ronis, for such a sweet intro. So as Ronis said, he's currently doing his PhD in WPI right after um, his graduation uh, from University of Mississippi. Uh, he and I went to same school. So that's how we know each other. Actually, like, let's go towards your major and, you know, what you did in undergraduate and how much scholarship you had in undergraduate and then how you um, found this graduate school in Massachusetts um, and um, uh, are you on full scholarship and let's talk about like what that looks like. Um, so, so initially I started out with taking some uh, SAT prep classes. Uh, there was this consultancy, uh, God, which place it was in, but yeah. It was near a vibrant. And then, yeah, I took around three months of classes there, studied. Uh, I don't think I, they helped too much. I did most of my own studying and then finally gave my SATs, got done, started applying. And one of my school friends had gone to University of Mississippi a semester before me. So I heard about the university, I applied there and fortunately also got a full scholarship to study there. So that's how my journey began. Wow, awesome, thanks for sharing that. Um, so do you mind sharing your um, SAT score and TOEFL and what your high school GPA was and uh, you know if that helped towards um, getting scholarship to uh, other colleges that you might have applied to or even University of Mississippi? Okay, uh, my SAT score, I don't think I remember. My writing and maths total was around 1260, which is uh, slightly above average, but not so good as either. Uh, my high school GPA was, I don't know the GPA scale, but it was 82%. Uh, TOEFL score was very good, 108, but I don't think that matters a lot in terms of scholarship. So I think uh, my high school GPA and uh, SAT scores played a crucial role in deciding uh, the kind of funding I received. Okay, awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, yeah, definitely. I don't think TOEFL matters much. I think it's only just a, you know, a proof yeah, a that- for uh, proving that you can communicate, write and read in English, that's it. Right, and, and until and unless you meet the bare minimum of the mm. college, um, you should be completely fine. I think SAT score uh, does matter for some universities. Like, I don't know what other colleges you applied to. Uh, did they um, give you a scholarship uh, based on SAT or what was that like? Um, I applied to the University of Idaho. They only gave me half scholarship. I'm not sure what their criteria was. Maybe it was the SATs, maybe not. Can't really tell for sure. Okay. Um, and um, another question that I had in my mind was uh, regarding, uh, you know, you said you got half scholarship. So would you recommend student from Nepal come here um, on half scholarship? Um, let's say if they were supposed to pay around um, $6,000 a year um, or even more, uh, do you recommend them coming to United States for undergraduate degree? Um, I guess there is a threshold that you cannot cross. Maybe 6,000 per year is a little bit doable. 
but anything higher than let's say eight will be very difficult to manage even if you're working a lot and at that point paying above eight thousand a year you'll be have to be working a lot and you won't have time for your studies that means you'll only stretch out your undergraduate years so yeah i think uh, judging by you should judge your finances look at how much you can afford and not just rely on yourself for your undergrad years because things might happen there are also uh, legal limits that you cannot work more than 20 hours a week here so that also comes into play so yeah anything yeah for a uh, let's say for an upper middle class family in Nepal, anything above 8,000 will be too much. Okay, yeah, um, thank you for sharing that because there's only like 20 hours that you can do. But uh, if your tuition is high and you don't have any other financial support, it's definitely going to be harder on you. And I've seen people uh, lose their motivation because of that, uh, you know. Um, and I guess... Um, Something else I wanted to ask you, Ranish, is uh, you said you're a chemical engineering major. So were you really passionate about chemistry um, since the beginning or like uh, what, um, how did you get into selecting chemical engineering? Well, um, there is no great backstory and there are very unrelated circumstances as well. My father is a chemistry professor, but that's not actually how I got interested <laughs> in the chemistry. It's just happened okay so in high school i was really good at it and yeah as i told you i was also good at maths so chemical engineering seemed like the right fit but as i kept studying it in undergrad then i realized that this is more engineering focused people think it's more chemistry but it's actually more engineering it's dealing with the large scale process the problems that come with it the problems that arise in flow and diffusion and stuff like that and yeah it's very much more process related than going down to the bare chemistries of it yeah okay yeah because um yeah, i've not heard a lot of people doing chemical engineering you know like if you were to suggest um someone who is coming from nepal to pick a field or you know because I, at the beginning can be uh, really confusing because you are you know bombarded with a lot of options and someone is saying you know to study computer science someone is saying to go to medical school and all that um what would you suggest for people um coming to united states uh, I mean, like what should they pursue if they are not really sure what they are passionate about quite yet if that question makes sense yeah and that's one of the benefits of coming here i think you don't have to decide that early i've seen friends a lot of my friends they've switched degrees like one one and a half years into their degree so it's yeah you can take your time see and explore other classes there are no like limits on you taking uh, most of the general classes they don't have any prerequisites you can just take them add them to your uh, calendar and go to them uh, see what it's like and then decide when I mean, you have an entire year I think yeah that should be enough for you to want to choose their career and or not their career but at least a degree in yeah I think that's a really good point because I don't think we get that privilege in Nepal you know you just mm -hmm. have to go to either engineering medical or arts or whatever or accounting but here you can actually explore uh, take a couple of classes you know I took accounting but um i after my very first class i was like no this is not what i want so i then switched back to computer science and like you said yeah um, even i've seen people who have switched their major one and a half year after uh you know they start their college so that's uh, thanks for bringing that up actually soon so that you know a lot of you guys know uh, that you are not really um you should not really cling to you know, selecting a yeah. major, you can just like explore. I think, um, I think even after two years, you can change your major, uh, but it kind of has to be in the same realm. Like you can't go from like engineering to arts directly. So if it's something in engineering, you can always switch because the classes you take, the first couple of classes you take in your like first year, first year and a half 
are pretty much the same. They're like foundational engineering classes. So yeah, it's pretty easy to make that switch even later on. Yeah, uh, that's a really good point. Um, and towards my next question, um, I would like to ask you, um, like you said, you know, we get to work 20 hours per week. Uh, where did you work and how to take advantage, you know, of um, on-campus jobs and uh, how to, I guess, get jobs that, you know, looking at a bigger picture uh, in your career, how to find job that aligns to your career, I think is a better way to put it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I just simply contacted this professor from my university. I just looked him up online. He was doing some interesting research uh, with sustainable things and wastewater treatment. So I shot him an email. He replied back the next day. Let's, he said, let's talk. And then we met the next day. I told him about my interests, told him about what I would like to achieve. And then he said, start joining uh, his group meetings to get me a better idea of what their uh, group was focused on. And then after my second year, starting from my third year, from the summer itself, I started working as a research assistant, like undergraduate research assistant, I was still doing only 20 hours per week, but I was getting to work in things related to chemical engineering. So yeah, I did that for the next two years, the third and fourth year of my undergraduate. And yeah, it was a very well knowledgeful experience. Taught me a lot about patience, about perseverance, about what research is like, and also made a lot of good friends in that time. And well, that's, I think, how I got into WPI. I was actually at a conference uh, presenting my research stuff in Orlando, I think. It was a chemical engineering, American Institute of Chemical Engineering's uh, conference. And they had this graduate school career fair. Graduate school is either a master's or a PhD. And that's where I met my current advisor, my PhD advisor. And that's where we started talking. Then that two months later led to exchange of emails. We met via Zoom. And then I applied, I visited the school. I really liked it. I really liked his uh, topics. So I joined. What you're doing your PhD right now and I think I get a lot of questions regarding uh, whether you should come to United States for your undergraduate or graduate degree. And you know, you mentioned that uh, undergraduate was a time where you, you know, made a lot of friends and had the connections. Mm -hmm. um, do you think it's better to come to United States early than later? Or what are your thoughts on that? Mm, it's kind of a hard question to answer. Clearly depends on the person's circumstances i would say in terms of finances it's very easy well it's certainly better to come as a graduate student but yeah if you really want to come then yeah you should look into your finances if if you really want to come as an undergraduate you should look at your finances look at the scholarship that you've got look at how much you can manage and then yeah i think there's there's a lot of hurdles to overcome when you come here as an undergrad. So expect to be challenged. But yeah, I think well, I've seen even, you know, all of my friends, I've seen them adapt to the situation. So I think that you can do it if you come here. You just have to stay a little strong. And I think like you know, any kind of personality, any kind of character, any kind of human being can adapt to this surrounding if they try. Uh, now you mentioned about some challenges. What are the points, you know, in favor of coming to United States early for undergraduate? Because for me personally, I think it's better coming um, for your bachelor's degree because number one, you get to learn a lot. And number two, you're young and, you know, there's more chances you're going to get the visa because we have, we have a lot of mutual friends whose visa got denied when they applied to master's, even with full scholarship, mm -hmm. because, you know, visa officers think that um, they might not return, right? And number two being that, and number three being, uh, you just really 
get to know what America is like. You make a lot of American friends and learn about the culture, which I think is not necessarily the case for a uh, master's or PhD because uh, at that point you are really focused on research and you just, um, you know, work for professor and all and well, not really have much of a social life. I say that because I've also seen other friends of mine who have just come here and all they do is like, take a few classes every semester and then work the rest of the time. So we were very lucky in regards that we had a full scholarship. We had to pay some amounts for insurance and stuff, other things like that. And that was also very hard, but you know, most of it was already covered and we could at least enjoy some of our time, some of our young time. But yeah, I've seen others who are like just completely stressed. And you know, even in the summertime, they're just worried about how to make ends meet for the future for current times so yeah it can be pretty stressful but yeah there are of course advantages i mean one of my friends uh, especially in terms of graduate school applications um, one of my friends from a foreign country could not get any replies because maybe because she was applying from a different country but when i was uh, contacting professors here I think I got a very good reply rate, reply percentage, I'd say. Right, yeah, that's a good point that you bring uh, up regarding like- They do prefer, you know, if they're looking for PhDs, they do prefer to hire from within the United States. Much easier, I think. Yeah, and I think um, I, um, kind of like, yeah, I didn't take the point into consideration that we were kind of fortunate that we didn't have to worry much about our, um, you know, tuition fees. Um, but it's not true for all the people, like you said, even my friends in Texas, right? They yeah. take you online classes. Yes, it was very hard sometimes, right? We had to, I mean, I oh, didn't yeah, yeah. just the money back home, my parents. Yeah, so some of the time, yeah, I had like an emergency tooth uh, surgery that needed to be done, done and I was out of money because it was really like tight you know if there were any additional expense then there was no way we were gonna pay it um, but you know, if things work out in your favor <laughs> then um, that's great but you have to keep it in mind that um, you, know, you should be prepared for the worst if that makes sense um, but Ranish you said um, you had to ask for money from Nepal right during um some of the years like uh how much do you think you spent in total for your undergraduate degree in university of mississippi in total mm -hmm. for four years um four, four, i think around eight sixteen thousand right how much eight eight sixteen what, what did you say? It's uh, around 16,000. Oh, around 16. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, that sounds about right. Uh, yeah, sounds about right. And I think um, that's actually a great <laughs> price to be, you know, getting done with your undergraduate in America because even in Nepal, you are kind of expected to pay that much, right? Like within 15 lakhs, 20 lakhs. For, yeah. I know. Okay. Okay. Yeah, it depends on the degree, but uh, how much did your job help toward that expense? Like you said, you worked as resident, sorry, research assistant, right? Um, the last two years, uh, how much did that pay you? Yeah, for all the undergraduate research assistant, the uh, pay was basically fixed, I think, at $10 an hour. That's only like slightly higher than Mississippi's $8 minimum i think it's, it's not minimum. slightly it's 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 what 20 percent more it's actually <laughs> really good yeah yeah and okay. in the summer they just pumped it uh to around 14 but that was only for one summer i was there yeah so yeah that was just basically enough for rent and food and some other stuff i don't think it was that enough to pay for school because of the 16,000, I think I only paid for like 40% 40, 40 of it myself. The rest was my parents. 
Yeah, and um, so yeah, we should be grateful that you know our parents support us or us. Not sure what we would have done, right? Um, so, Ronish, you said that after you did your research, that's how you know you went to the different conferences. You met with a lot of other professors because obviously you didn't want to do your grad school in Mississippi. Yeah, you know you wanted to look for other options. So what other colleges did you apply to? Because I know audience are probably looking for some of the good colleges to apply to. So if you could just name a few, uh, maybe that would help them. Well, I applied to a couple different ones. I got a bit too humble and also applied to MIT and Harvard, <laughs> I think. Yeah. They Do me. You get it? <laughs> I applied to a lot of uh, North colleges in the Northeast. So I applied to Northeastern, applied to Tufts, applied to Boston University as well, but they didn't have a chemical engineering program. They only had biomed, but I applied to that as well. So <laughs> I think I got instantly rejected. Uh, and during the conferences, I had met a few universities, University of Arkansas uh, and also University of Notre Dame. I had a good chat with them, so yeah. I actually got the chance to also visit Notre Dame. And yeah, it was a pretty cold place. I met with a professor. They also offered me a PhD there. But ultimately, I think I was more confident with my professor at WPI. So I chose my college in terms of prioritizing my professor first and the research. Right, because uh, University of Notre Dame is actually a really good university and it probably ranks much higher than, you know, Worcester Polytechnic Institute where you go to currently, right? Or is it the same ranking? Not I sure. think it is higher, University of Notre Dame. I don't know the graduate ranking, but the undergraduate ranking is certainly higher. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's definitely, yeah. It's definitely they are uh, like a rich college. Um, mm -hmm. And what were the key determining factors for you in terms of and this is where I want to go. Like you said, like a professor, um, anything other than that? So yeah, I was, I was pretty torn between those two colleges till the very end. Um, and my final decision, I think, was based on, yeah, mostly the professor and also some personal situation. So yeah, I and went- And also the, the weather. Yeah, also the weather. <laughs> So yeah, the two years in undergrad that I worked as a research assistant, I got familiar with a lot of grad students as well and their how their life functions and all that. And when I visited Notre Dame, it was a pretty, uh, pretty cold, pretty, well, lower than suburban kind of place. So it was a pretty quiet place, I think. And I just thought that the next five years, I don't think I could like survive and fully <laughs> enjoy my life there. So, you know, because grad school, yeah, there's always, there's also going through a PhD is also mentally very, can be mentally very uh, difficult sometimes. So you need a, well, some kind of a good break or like relief sometimes. So I think, yeah, I think I can get that here around WPI. And also <laughs> because personally, uh, my girlfriend was also moving to the Northeast. So that also became a huge factor. Uh, yeah, uh, great point regarding how master's or PhD mm -hmm. can be challenging because we have seen our friends uh, basically, they spend all their time in their labs and they, it's, there's no weekend for them. You know, they are just so consumed with the experiment because obviously experiment take up a lot of time. You know, it, it really requires patience and you have to graduate on time, deliver um, the data, you know, whatever is required. So uh, you would want to be in some happening place. But ultimately, that is definitely, that is the last factor, uh, right? When you have a lot of options and, you know, you get to... Choose yeah. um, based on yeah, whether it was between Notre Dame and University of Arkansas, and yeah, I would have chosen Notre Dame. But yeah, exactly. Even though if it was cold, because Arkansas um, isn't Arkansas the most racist state? 
or was it Mississippi? <laughs> They're on Mississippi, Alabama, Arkansas. I've heard that in Arkansas. I think that's pretty brutal. But um, anyway, off topic. Um, so next, uh, next stop, you are at WPI. Um, and what does your scholarship and your stipend look like? Actually, like talk to uh, my audience regarding the stipend and how PhD works. Is it like a full time job? Is, is it like a part time job? Like how that works? Um, and and um, for masters, um, is there a similar type of program for masters where people provide scholarship as well as stipend? Like, um, stipend is money that's given to you for your like living and expenses so for rent food you know for utilities electricity internet and stuff it's to cover all your expenses every month and in a phd you are well you work a lot but you're technically still considered a student you just actually people say that you're paid to go to school they, but you also do a lot of work. So I think that balances it out and you get paid this yearly stipend, which can range anywhere from 25, 20 to 35, also up to 40, I think, 40,000 per year. And that should, I think, cover most of your expenses. You won't have any savings, but you will, it's just enough, I think, to get by on peacefully without having to, live an undergrad life so you can still live a normal life and get through it you just won't have any savings awesome and um and in terms you... of, uh, for the master's student it can be pretty challenging to get a full scholarship and a stipend um in university of mississippi uh, we 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 saw a few in that route yeah but yeah, I here I haven't seen anyone. So I think it also depends on the colleges and the states. But yeah, it, it, it is more challenging to get a fully funded master's than a fully funded PhD, I think. It's easy to yeah, get I a master's, it's... but you have to pay for it. Yeah, getting a master's is kind of easy because there is not much scholarship. And college wants you, so they will admit, but mm -hmm. you know, they will expect you to pay money. Um, so yeah, you know, even classes also cost like almost 1.5 to two times more than undergraduate classes. So all in all, getting getting a master's or being admitted to a school for master's is easy, but getting that scholarship and stipend is tough. And we did see some folks in University of Mississippi getting the master's plus the stipend. But that was mostly because they already had the connection during their undergraduate years. Uh, you know, so after they went to master's, they were able to get that. Um, a funded master's is only possible if you are doing research, if you are doing a thesis, because there are other options. There is a just non-thesis course space options where you just pass courses, do a project and graduate. There's a thesis option where you have to do research and submit a thesis. If you okay. want to do the funded thing, then yeah, you have to do research. And um, like, how would you uh, suggest students to apply to like find colleges for a master's or PhD? Oh, also, sorry, sorry. Before that question, though, so you jumped directly from undergraduate to PhD, which is very uncommon for people in Nepal or wherever. I think even it sounded weird to me at first because how can you go from bachelor's to PhD directly without having master's? So talk to us more about that. How is it possible? Uh, it's possible. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> possible. They, they just let you do it, I think. So I, my question then, if someone in Nepal who is doing undergraduate mm -hmm. and who is almost done wants to apply here for a PhD, are there good chances that he might, he or she might be accepted? Yeah. A lot of people come directly to do their PhDs without even doing their master's. So it's think doable. That's really cool. Okay. Yeah. One of my friends just, he just got, he came to New York a few days ago 
he's doing his PhD in computer science. So yeah, he did it wow. right after his bachelor's. Okay, do you know what university? University? Somewhere in Rochester, I think. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, north, north, upstate New York. Okay, audience, do a look up for that university. They might be accepting applicants. Um, and yeah, so if you are if you get into PhD, then hundred percent you will get a full scholarship and a stipend, right? It's like a no brainer. <laughs> um, okay, so another question uh, was how much is the tuition in WPI where you currently go, and uh, how much do you have to pay per year? Uh, not sure how much the undergraduate tuition is. The graduate tuition, I think, is. Uh, around 40 or 50, I don't know, I'm not sure. It's somewhere around that. Okay. Then, well, I, yeah, I get a stipend and I don't have, the only things I have to pay for is about 30% of my health insurance, 70% is covered by school. There are some other small fees, they're very small, like around 100 or $150 per semester. And yeah, that's that's it. Okay, and um, yeah, and so the stipends I, will be based yeah. also. Well, they're in that same range, but they will be based on what state you're going to, the cost of living in that area. Yeah. Okay, and what would you say the average stipend would look like for a PhD student uh, up north here, somewhere here? Up north, I think. Uh, STEM majors should be around 30,000 or more. A year, a year, which would mean 2,500 per month around, not, not 25. Not 25, 2,000 2, per month. Uh, which is really, which is, I mean, <laughs> seems yeah, if, pretty If you're right, frugal, but... then yeah, 2,000, it can be enough. But yeah, there are <laughs> always like, well, it's for five years, so you have to think and take that into account as yet. Yeah, you really have to be interested in the research and the topic that you are researching on to be able to go through this entire journey. Yeah, which brings me back to the question that I already asked you. So then if it's hard to get scholarship for master's and it takes you five years to do your PhD. That would ultimately make, you know, bachelor's the best time to come to the United States, right? Again, again, considering you have enough scholarship. So really, really, really work hard for like until, you know, from 10th grade to 12th grade and apply to all the university, get, get in some university with that good uh, tuition fee um, with, you know, scholarships and stuff. And that would, be ideal, right? Yeah, it could work. It worked for us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and sometimes yeah, it can uh, it can go sour as well. If if it's just your if you just make it make up your mind that you have to come here, you know, and not consider any of the other things that you know, just say that yeah, I'm gonna make it. It's fine. I'm gonna work. It's gonna be okay. It's gonna get really hard as you go along. You will learn to adapt. Everybody does, but yeah, in some situations, it might be too hard. In some situations, you mean without enough scholarship? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, if the tuition is like really, really high, then yeah, even if you, no matter how many, how many hours or how much you work, how hard you work, it may not be enough. And that can certainly right. hamper a lot of other things as well. Not okay, just- so so the first thing first, get, get good scholarship, right? And Ranish, you said you applied through a consultancy. Do you recommend the same for other students? Um, I think <laughs> now it's become fairly easy. I think at my time was, well, it wasn't that difficult, but it gave me kind of a peace of mind doing it. But yeah, if you know that you can like go through all of that stuff yourself 
you can have a you can just take a look and see what the forms are like what the application is like how to browse through colleges i think there are lots of channels like yours in youtube that provide uh, good information about this so after looking at this if you feel like you have a grasp on it then yeah go for it otherwise yeah there's always that option you'll need to get a good sat score yeah speaking of standardized test scores mm -hmm. what was your you had to give gr gre yeah um, what was that process like? <laughs> Just reading for that and how much did you score, if you don't mind sharing? It was the beginning of my fourth year, so my senior year. So I was, uh, I was extremely, extremely, extremely busy. That <laughs> when I gave the GRE, I mean, that was the busiest month of my entire undergraduate you know, life. And I, I had already booked that date to give the GRE on. I did not study that much. I maybe I think focused too much on English. Where I should have focused more on maths because that's where you get all the points. But yeah, I think I did average slightly <laughs> the same as the SAT is slightly above average. But because I had done so much research, I don't think it mattered to the schools that I got into because I don't. I don't think I sent my scores to either. Notre Dame or I think I said my school to WPI, but not Notre Dame. But I don't think that played such a big part in getting me accepted into WPI. Yeah, well, like I feel like someone in Nepal, it's kind of like an unfair advantage that you had, that you know, you had uh, some lab experience in undergraduate, mm -hmm. which is not really common for some international students, right? Because I think we Nepali folks, we are like too into our board exams and uh, we don't even have like a lab program or research program. So definitely GRE would probably matter more for mm -hmm. the students. And um, what else was I missing? GRE is for, um, okay, so, and what are you now currently working as for summer? Well, this summer I'm working as an R&D intern for St. Cobain. So this is a research and development internship. So yeah, it's uh, mostly, I think, 70% lab work and 30% other stuff. So it's, a, it's been a great time. I'm actually getting to do some kind of industrial research, which has near term applications rather than just doing academic research, which is very promising, but very also way into the future. Are they paying you in terms of you know, hourly? Um, paying, you can just say the range. You don't have to be exact. Yeah, it's between, uh, well, in Massachusetts, it's between always, I think, 20 to $25 per hour, mostly. And yeah, yeah. it's like slightly... So per, on a per month basis, I'm getting around six, seven hundred more than my PhD stipend. So yeah, right. it's a slight financial help. Yeah, it's cool that they let you do internship while you are doing PhD. You know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think. Yeah, yeah. They, it's it's a good thing to do even if you're a PhD, because like if later on you want to go into the industrial sector which most PhDs now do because, yeah, academia is a different route and a very less probabilistic route. So, yeah, I think around 80% of PhDs do end up going into industry. So when you go there, I think having some internship experience is valuable. Thanks for sharing uh, such a tremendous amount of your experience and your suggestions. Um, it was really, really nice talking to you. I hope you enjoyed the interview as well. Uh, there was not really a strict yeah. agenda, um, just like Q&A. Yeah, yeah, I'm glad you enjoyed it. <laughs> well, good night and thank you. Bye-bye.